On the evening of April 28, 2001, the police were out in the wooded area of Hibbs Park, 59th Street at Kensington Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri, searching for an elderly man who was reported missing by his friend. But instead of finding the man, they stumbled on a horrible discovery of a decapitated body of a female toddler in the woods. On May 1, 2001, the child's missing head was found wrapped in a plastic bag about 200 yards from where her decapitated body was found. The head had decomposed beyond recognition, and no one had reported the child missing. Since her identity was unknown, the police gave her a name, Precious Doe. This discovery came with a lot of unanswered questions. Who was this child? Why had she been murdered in such a horrific way? So without any further ado, let's dive right into this mystery. Kansas City, Missouri is known for its vast prairies, rolling hills, and natural beauty. Kansas is blessed with a lot of cultural attractions, which include museums and art galleries. It is appropriately nicknamed the Sunflower State, with over 20 designated wildflower trails which can be found all over the state in both rural and urban areas. With a population over 500,000 people, Kansas City has a high violent crime rate of 57 per 1,000 residents, making it one of the cities with a high crime rate in America. And in this city, our story begins. On April 4, 2001, Michelle and Harold went to Betty's place again to pick up Erica for a family reunion. Betty was reluctant to release the little girl because of how much she loved her, and also because she prepared for Erica to spend the Easter holiday with her, as Easter was just around the corner. But Betty had no choice, since Michelle was the biological mother. Betty packed up Erica's things, including her favorite doll, and the new dresses she bought for her to wear on Easter. She bid Erica farewell, unknown to her that it was the last time she would see her. Harold also had children before he met Michelle which was probably why they both agreed to take the youngest of their children with them to Kansas City, Missouri. Harold took his six-month-old child, Markeisha Johnson. They didn't take all of their children with them to Kansas City for different reasons. One, because the apartment in Kansas belonged to Lawanda Driscoll, Harold's cousin, and also because Michelle already had her other four children elsewhere. Weeks passed, and Lawanda Driscoll, Harold's cousin, soon noticed that she wasn't seeing Erica around. She asked Michelle about Erica's whereabouts, and she told Lawanda that Betty Brown had come from Oklahoma to take Erica. On the evening of April 28, 2001, the police received a call from an unknown man who said he's been trying to reach his friend for a while but couldn't get through to him. He asked that the police help him to conduct a welfare check on his friend, which the police did, but as they were unable to find the man at his residence, they had to search the wooded area near Hibbs Park, 59th Street at Kensington Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri. After searching for a while, the police got a call that the man they were looking for had been found. But as they were about to leave, they stumbled upon a horrific sight. It was the decapitated body of a toddler. In no time, the police had determined that the body belonged to a female toddler because the body was found naked. The police immediately found the discovery suspicious. They wondered why a toddler's body would be lying in the woods and also wondered why no one reported that child of her age was missing in the area. The investigators were left at a dead end. Without the body's head, there was no way the investigation would progress. All they could do was determine the age and the sex of the child. They found out that the lifeless body belonged to a black female of about three to six years of age and also that she had been abused before she was murdered. May 1, 2001 Three days after the body was found, a volunteer searcher found the child's head wrapped in a plastic bag about 200 yards from where her body was discovered. Beside the body was an ashtray that the police believe was the murder weapon. But even with the head found, the police could not identify the owner of the body as the head decomposed beyond recognition. The murder soon gained national attention due to the age of the victim and how gruesome it was. The investigators continued with their investigation and hoped that the parent or guardian of the child would come forward to claim her body, but no one came. When the victim's identity could not be established, the victim was dubbed Precious Doe. Soon, many members of the public volunteered to spread the word about Precious Doe through flyers, radio, television, and papers, and even went door to door to ask questions that could provide a link to the victim's identity. 
The case was featured on America's Most Wanted and Cold Case Files many times to identify the little girl. But even after all that, no witnesses came forward and nobody claimed the child. In December 2001, members of the public raised money for Precious Doe's funeral, which was held at Hibbs Park near where her body was found. The residents of the area came out in numbers as hundreds of people were in attendance. But even as much as the case garnered attention, Precious Doe's identity remained a mystery. In 2002, the police exhumed Precious Doe's body for an autopsy to be conducted, and the results shows that she had been seriously beaten with an ashtray and also abused before she was murdered. Police tested the ashtray for fingerprints and DNA, but nothing was found. Four hours away from their families to investigate this case was hard because everybody began to feel that, I don't know that we're ever going to solve it. You know, we've gone national. We've done everything we can think of doing to get this child identified, and we just had no luck. In July 2003, investigators studied the likeness of Precious Doe's skull and also created busts that showed what she may have looked like. Due to the popularity of the case, the police constantly received tips, sometimes near and sometimes far away. At a time, the police received a call from Jamaica concerning the case, but they found out that it had nothing to do with Precious Doe's identity. Soon the police became busy with other cases, and the public lost hope. But Alonzo Washington, a vocal activist for Precious Doe's case, never stopped searching for answers. Alonzo posted adverts on the case in a local newspaper every year. In April 2005, at Precious Doe's fourth year memorial, Alonzo thought of putting the ad in an African-American newspaper because the victim was a black American and also made t-shirts with the bus picture of Precious Doe on it, and that became the breakthrough the case needed. On April 30, 2005, Alonzo received a call from a man named Thurman McIntosh, who was later identified as Harold Johnson's father, claiming to know all about the Precious Doe case. Alonzo listened to the 81-year-old Thurman's words who claimed that Precious Doe's identity was Erica Green. He also claimed that his son, Harold Johnson, killed Erica Green. Alonzo questioned Thurman about why he kept the secret since 2001 and was just revealing it in 2005. Thurman claimed that the police dismissed him whenever he called to tip them about the case. Alonzo then urged Thurman to get him a strand of Michelle's hair and also a picture of Erica. Immediately after Alonzo received a hair sample from Thurman, he sent it to Detective David Bernard, the detective who led the Precious Doe case. On May 4, 2005, Thurman was brought in for questioning, and there he told the investigators why he was sure that his son did it. When Thurman stopped seeing Erica around, he questioned Michelle and Harold about her whereabouts. Because, you know, as an activist, I hear about a lot of, you know, citizens who feel like the police are not listening to their concerns. To which they both answered that she was with Betty in Oklahoma. And suddenly, when the couple and Markeisha were relocating back to Oklahoma, Thurman said he suspected that Precious Doe was Erica Green. Thurman then confronted Harold and told him he knew he killed Erica, and Harold responded by saying that it was a mistake. As soon as Thurman knew the truth, he said he wanted to tell the whole world what happened to Precious Doe before he died. Although the picture Thurman provided was for one of Erica's cousins, the hair was a complete match to Precious Doe's. Finally, the police were able to pronounce Precious Doe as Erica Green. The little girl we have known for four years as Precious Doe has a name. Erica Michelle Marie Green. Erica Green was born on May 15, 1997, in McLeod, Oklahoma, United States of America. She was the youngest of five children that her mother, Michelle Johnson, had with her father, Larry Green. When Michelle was eight months pregnant with Erica, she was convicted of larceny of merchandise from a retailer and was sentenced to two years of custody with the Oklahoma Department of Corrections, but was housed in Mabel Bassett Correctional Center because she was pregnant. Michelle had only served one month of her sentence when she fell into labor. She was taken to the OU Medical Center in Oklahoma City, where she delivered Erica Green. Unable to take care of Erica, she was asked to contact a guardian that would help her hold her baby until her release. Michelle contacted Erica's father, Larry Green, to get a guardian for their child. Larry would then call Betty Brown, a woman in her late 60s who happened to be Larry's mother's friend. Betty got to the correctional facility and was asked to do a few things to gain custody of Erica. 
The correctional facility authorities did not conduct a background check to know if Betty was fit to have custody of the child. She only provided her driver's license and a card from Sam's Club. She was asked to sign a form. After this was done, Betty was granted custody of Erica Green on May 16, 1997. Betty loved and cared for Erica as her own child, and she described Erica as one of the most independent children she ever met. She also said Erica was a lovely girl who was always smiling, and whenever she took Erica with her to church, people loved her. Michelle was then released on probation on October 23, 1997. According to Betty, Michelle was not so interested in taking care of Erica, as she only visited Betty Brown once in a while to check on her child. In 2000, by the time Erica was three years old, Michelle had already found a new lover named Harold Johnson, who she later married in 2002. Michelle soon moved in with Harold Johnson to his place in Oklahoma. Once the police confirmed that the body was Erica, they looked for her mother Michelle and her partner Harold. Both Michelle and Harold had been arrested on some warrants in Oklahoma and were in the Muskegee County Jail, Oklahoma. The police wasted no time. They immediately proceeded to the facility to question Michelle and Harold Johnson. Michelle was the first to be questioned. During the questioning, the police showed Erica's picture to Michelle, who identified her daughter and wrote a note at the back. She wrote, Mama is sorry. You are always in my heart and soul. Love you always, little E. After she had done that, she agreed to tell the police how the murder happened. According to Michelle, on the evening of April 2001, the family arrived home around 8 p.m., and soon Harold became high on PCP and alcohol. Michelle instructed Erica, who was in the same room with Harold, to go to bed while Michelle went to the bathroom. Before she got out of the shower, Harold had begun to complain about Erica being bad, because she refused to go to bed. After Harold told Erica to go to bed about five to six times, he became agitated. By the time Michelle came out of the bathroom, Erica was again out of her bed. She then ordered Erica to go back to her bed, but Erica remained standing. At that point, Harold kicked Erica till she lost consciousness. Michelle said she rushed to pick Erica up and placed her in a cold bathtub, but she wouldn't wake up. That was when Michelle knew something serious had happened. After about 15 minutes, Michelle took Erica to the bathroom and laid her on the floor, but Erica remained unconscious and unresponsive. Put her in the bathtub. She didn't get up. She didn't respond. She didn't wake up, so I took her out the bathroom and then I laid her on the floor. At that point, Michelle and Harold knew that Erica needed medical attention, but the two decided not to seek medical attention because they had outstanding warrants. Michelle agreed not to call an ambulance because she didn't want to go to jail, even though she knew that Erica could die. For about 10 to 14 hours, Erica was still unconscious, and by the following morning, she had died. After Erica died, Harold and Michelle hid her body in a baby stroller. According to Michelle, they were both scared and didn't know what to do, so they agreed to dispose of the body eventually. They waited until it got dark to make sure no one saw them, and they both took Erica's body out through the window of the house and went straight to the woods. Harold believed that leaving the body the way it was might eventually lead the police to their home, so he thought of removing the head with hedge clippers and also disfigured the head to make recognition difficult. They wrapped the head in plastic bags and disposed of it in a dumpster at a church they found nearby. But Michelle thought that was not a good idea. She told Harold to take out the head as the smell might alert the church owners. Harold did as his wife suggested and threw the head in a wooded area at Hibbs Park. Harold then removed Erica's clothes from her body and gave them to Michelle, leaving her body in the woods. The two of them returned home and entered the room the same way they got out. No one saw what they did, but LaWanda Driscoll would soon notice that Erica was absent. She asked Michelle where she was, and Michelle lied that she was lying in the room as she was sick. After Michelle gave her account of what happened, she asked the police to take her to see Harold. She told Harold that she had already confessed to their crimes and urged him to do the same. Harold became upset at first and begged Michelle to change her statement, but Michelle's mind was already made up as she also agreed to testify against him in court. Harold later agreed to make an oral statement, where he described the way he killed Erica and removed her head. While he was being questioned, he was also shown Erica's picture, which he took and also wrote a note behind it 
that reads, I'm so sorry that this happened, and I hope that you forgive me for what I have done, and I will always love you with my heart and my soul. I will always miss you. Carol Johnson. Charging the criminals in this case brought closure to many people who went all out to bring justice to Erica. In August 2005, the members of the public decided to give Erica a proper burial in her real name. Larry Green, Erica's father, unfortunately was in jail at the time. Kansas City Councilman Alvin Brooks said he and others tried to get Larry Green permission to attend his daughter's burial, but they were unsuccessful. Even though Erica's family was not present at her burial. Oh, she left, she said, I'll be back. The massive number of people that helped in getting justice for her would make her happy wherever she is. Just touch what she's in. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what it's like, but just to touch the cask, knowing my baby's in there. LaWanda Driscoll also gave her account of what she knew about the case. She said in the days before Erica's death, Carol had been beating her. LaWanda said the last time she heard of Erica was her scream from the bedroom. According to LaWanda, Erica cried a lot because she was not used to living with her mother and stepfather, and her tears earned her more beatings from Harold. She also said Harold would be Erica for anything and everything, no matter how trivial it is. LaWanda mentioned she heard Harold telling Michelle, You better go take care of your daughter, or I'm going to do something bad. About a week later, she heard a loud bang from the bedroom, which she now believes was the kick that left Erica unconscious. While everyone was looking for Precious Doe's identity, LaWanda said Michelle also helped hand out flyers to people and even cried at the girl's vigil. According to LaWanda, Michelle always had a response for anyone that asked questions concerning Erica. On May 5, 2005, Michelle and Harold were charged with the murder of Erica Green, endangering the welfare of a child, abandoning a corpse, and tampering with physical evidence. Michelle was not tried until 2007 when she pleaded guilty to second-degree murder and other related charges and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. As soon as Harold knew that Michelle was going to testify against him, he started saying things that would implicate her. He mentioned that Michelle never cared about Erica in the first place. He said Michelle would sometimes neglect Erica to go and use drugs, but everything he said is not new to the investigators. Harold didn't go to trial until 2008. Although Erica's autopsy listed her cause of death as a closed head injury, which occurs when the head hits an object, it wouldn't have been equal to first-degree murder. But the neurologist testified that Erica may have survived if she had received medical attention in the hours before her death. After a few days of deliberation, the jury found Harold guilty of first-degree murder, endangering the welfare of a child, and abusing a child. In November 2008, Harold was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Harold appealed, claiming still that he isn't the type of person the state said he is. There was back and forth between the defense attorney and the state attorney, with Harold's team, claiming that the murder was not premeditated. However, the state believed that Erica's murder was premeditated. During Michelle's confession, she mentioned that on the night of Erica's murder, she told Harold not to order Erica around and that he should only give his orders to Marquisha. The state believed that Michelle's statement annoyed Harold, and at that moment he thought of killing Erica. Also, the autopsy shows that Erica was kicked multiple times, which shows that Harold intentionally continued to kick the little girl, knowing well that she could die. People don't know me. You just know what these people done cooked up and what I was forced to say. That's all you know. But never once have I harmed a hair on her head or did anything to hurt her. Judge John Torrance believed that Harold showed no remorse by appealing the judgment, claiming the murder was not premeditated. The judge called Harold a textbook sociopath who won't take responsibility for his actions and therefore ruled out his appeal. You committed acts that were ghoulish, vile, and by any measure revolting. Though revealing Erica's identity brought closure to those who were all out for her, this sentencing was one of what brought relief to many people. Everyone that attended the sentencing for Erica was pleased with the judgment given to Harold, but some people wanted Michelle to also get the same sentence. Larry Green, Erica's biological father, 
also filed a lawsuit against the Oklahoma D.C., questioning the process for determining the custody of babies born to mothers in prison. The Department of Human Services and the Department of Corrections, however, agreed to adopt new procedures to ensure that babies born into inmates will be referred to the Department of Human Services for proper care. Erica Green's case is a reminder that evil resides in the heart of man. While parents are known to cherish their little ones and always protect them, it is appalling and sad to know that some parents would save themselves, not thinking about what might happen to their children. A lot of people who know about Erica's case have some things to say about the sentencing. Do you also think that Michelle should have gotten a more severe punishment because she was the biological mother? Let us know in the comment section. If you have a case you'd like us to cover, let us know that as well. And as always, do like and subscribe to the channel for more true crime content.